questions there throughout. So I'd like to give a big welcome to all of our audience participants today, as well as thank you to Dr. Martin Helena for being our guest presenter and sharing his work today. I know there's lots of curiosities and questions. I'd like to start off today's program by saying how grateful I am to be able to live, learn, and teach on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the beauty of these programs are that we can have folks tuning in from all over the world. And we really appreciate the opportunity to inform our best practices as educators and researchers on observation, oral history, and using that in our everyday work um, and working with our local nations on those great practices. So we're so excited to be learning all about a veterinarian's role in conservation today from the Vancouver Aquarium's head veterinarian, Dr. Martin Helena. And without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Well, first of all, I'll look for the nod from Danica. Can you hear me okay? All right, perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, hopefully I won't bore you too quickly or, uh, or uh, you won't, I won't lose too, much, too many of you. But um, I thought I'd t share a story about how we developed uh, a way to successfully get to sea lions that have been entangled in any number of different types of gear and do a good thing for animals that have been directly affected by humans out there in the wild. I'd like to use this story because to me, it's a really cool example of how veterinarians work with a whole number of different people and in a whole number of different capacities. They still kind of get the idea from uh, many folks that look at me and go, well, shouldn't you be doing cat spays and dog neuters somewhere? And, and maybe I should be, quite frankly, maybe I should. Um, but um, my, my kind of... Um, I guess luck and, and great fortune has been to, to do some really cool things with, with really cool animals. So uh, without further ado, let's get to this. This is uh, our crew. <clears throat> this was last year's Christmas. And these are the guys, and I use that term in the generic sense, obviously, um, that I rely on every day and day to day. This is the greatest team in the world. And I am incredibly lucky to work with these guys. These are all uh, veterinarians and veterinary technicians that work in our hospital at the aquarium, as well as our um, marine mammal rescue center. This is home for the most part. This is our hospital at our rescue center. And uh, this is kind of where, where we do a lot of our work, but of course we work out in the field as well. And as you can tell from this slide, yeah, there were a lot of people involved with coming out with this, and I'm just the one talking about it today, but a lot of folks know a lot of stuff and work at a, a number of different institutions that, and over many, many years helped pull this all together. And I think, again, um, the story here for me is how a veterinarian that works um, with researchers in the field, a veterinarian that works with animals that live at the Vancouver Aquarium for their lives, and then also animals that come through rescue centers, how all of that had to come together to come up with something um, that has helped now quite a few animals around the world. So the story for me starts in 1998, and that's kind of what I looked like in 1998, I suppose. Um, shortly after I joined uh, the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito, California, the Marine Mammal Center is the the largest marine mammal rescue center in the world. And that was an incredible experience for me. I was the, the staff veterinarian there for, for almost 10 years. And I think the thing that really bothered me, especially and continues to bother me today, and I see a lot of suffering in animals, and, and some of that is, is natural. I, I get that, especially in wildlife. Um, but the things that affect he, um, animals that have been caused directly by humans, I, I suppose those are the things that really stick in my craw as they do for a lot of people. So. Early on, I was presented with this kind of scenario, and, and this is an adult male stellar sea lion. He's probably weighing um, here in Canada about 1,200, 1,100 kilograms to you guys in the U.S., probably about 2,400 pounds. And he's about six feet away from the water, um, which means that if you wanted to go and deal with him, what he's got hanging out of his mouth is a salmon flasher, which means that there's a hook deeply embedded 
in his esophagus or stomach. And we know a lot of these animals will pass away from this injury because the, the, the line, that, that heavy gauge monofilament that attaches that flash to that hook does start to dig in into the commissure of the side of the mouth and starts digging into bone and can cause an infection and interfere with, with uh, eating. So this was something that I wa really wanted to do with. Now, the convention at the time was that if you wanted to anesthetize a sea lion, you needed to dart or get um, some kind of anesthetic into that sea lion that would work really, really quickly so it, it wouldn't go in the water. So you can just imagine a um, thousand kilos, six feet for, from the water, what can we do? At the same time, folks that I was dealing with uh, in the wild had a huge problem on their hands. So I've got this animal welfare issue in California and, and up and down the Pacific. And then we've got this huge issue in the western uh, end of the range of stellar sea lions. We've got an endangered group, a highly endangered group of sea lion that is dropping. Um, these, folk, uh, these sea lions have dropped by 80% um, in their populations since the 80s, and they continue to drop. And the researchers there really, really, really needed to figure out a, fit, a, a really safe way to mobilize these animals and get onto them so that they could attach transmitters, get a bunch of samples, figure out what uh, vital foraging grounds were for these animals, what needed to be protected, what kind of diseases they might be passing through, what kind of reproductive success they might have, what kind of nutritional status they have. They had a whole lot of questions that need to be addressed to try and save this population. So we got animal welfare issues and, and kind of um, that, that stranding kind of situation going on. And then we've got an endangered population that's disappearing and folks can't do anything to help. So they, at that point in time, people were using a drug called telazol, which is a mixture of zolazepam and teletamine. And that was unfortunately, um, when darted into animals, again, the, the, the thought was you needed to get a, an anesthetic that acted super fast in these animals. So telazol does act fast, but the problem was they were losing at least 10%, if not more, of animals when they were darting them. That is considered unacceptable, and permits were now unobtainable for these guys. So they come to us. They've got a real problem. Guys at the Marine Mammal Center and elsewhere, what can you do? How can we figure things out? Can we develop a new way to get to these animals? And that's really, I guess, again, 1998, where, where we became involved. And what we did over time, mostly now at the Marine Mammal Center, is look at how anesthesia works in pinnipeds, particularly sea lions. How do they breathe? How does um, blood gas get changed? How can we better support them through anesthetics? What kind of anesthetics work? What kind of dosages work? Does it depend on the size of an, of an animal? Does species make a difference? What kind of tools are at our disposal to make things a better job? And we went through, and I'm gonna go through some slides relatively quickly here. I've got a kind of a, a varied audience and uh, I don't wanna to bore too many people too quickly. Um, but basically what we did was we took a really, really hard objective look at how sea lions are anesthetized, how we could better support them and looking at different drug combinations. And everything had kind of, you know, different pros and cons. So telazol um, was, was that old combination, which provided that, that really fast anesthetic and really reliable deep anesthetic that people thought we really needed to get to, uh, onto these animals, but we had a high mortality rate, an unacceptable mortality rate. We tried metatomine and ketamine, which was reversible and safe, but it required a really large volume. People weren't kind of condensing or concentrating the dosages at that time. And some animals just didn't get to sleep. They just weren't deep enough. And then we had, um, we tried to, you know, combine those things. So we'd combine that telazole with the metatomidine, which was reversible, which we thought, okay, let's go for reversible anesthetics. That, that might be a really big advantage. But we still had some mortalities um, there. And we had a couple of animals that really the anesthetic depth wasn't, wasn't awesome. And then my time at the Marine Mammal Center kind of came to a close, and that's kind of where we left it. But we in pretty good touch with uh, with folks that kept working there, and I'm, I'm going to circle back to them in a minute. Um, and I moved on to the Vancouver Aquarium, where within a couple of years of, of arriving there, now we're we're at about 2006, and in about 2007, I was presented with this guy, who to this day is one of the coolest animals I've ever dealt with. This is Tag, an adult male stellar sea lion. So yeah, he weighed about a thousand kilograms, and he had this problem um, that we started noticing. We kept uh, having an eye on it. We thought it was a tooth problem. And it was this kind of weird cyst that was around his canine. Now, at this stage, uh, Tag was already getting to be about 11 or 12 years old, which factors in. But eventually, we diagnosed cancer in Tag. Now, what we needed to do was do chemotherapy to, to improve his 
quality of life. And we also needed to do surgical laser debridement of that uh, cancer. So um, what we really, really, really needed for TAG, I mean, this was an animal that everybody was close to. This is an animal that we needed to anesthetize quite regularly. We needed something that was incredibly safe. And that's where we started playing with the metatomidine and midazolam and butorphanol combinations a little bit. Um, just to show you what chemotherapy looks like in a sea lion, he was not small and logistics here were incredible, but the team was amazing. And we did go and, and provide some really excellent therapy and gave him some really awesome quality of life. And um, it's TAG's legacy, and I always get teared up by this, but it's really TAG's legacy that has gone on to help a whole lot of other animals. So um, we did a lot of good stuff for TAG. I think we did really, really well by TAG. But yeah, in the end, TAG, um, TAG's cancer did catch up to him and, and he was euthanized um, back in June of 2008. But the story doesn't end there. So back to the field. Um, we had a group of sea lions that people were trying to get a hold of in Oregon. I met up with my buddy, Bill. This is Dr. Bill Van Bon, who uh, kind of took over my job at the Marine Mammal Center um, and then went on uh, back to the Shedd Aquarium. And we started looking at some combinations again in these big adult um, male sea lions. And we tried a few things. We tried um, you know, this metatomidine midazolam combination that was super safe, but oh my gosh, the sea lions were way too light. And then we tried that mixture again, the metatomidine and zolazepam, it was still too risky. And then we tried it. Metatomidine, midazolam, butorphanol, what we've gone through with TAG, um, and what Lucy Spellman, Dr. Lucy Spellman from uh, the National Zoo in Washington had also tried in sea lions and published on, and it worked. And it worked great. Um, and we could get the drugs concentrated. We could get a volume into a, a, a dart. Um, it seemed to produce pretty deep anesthetic, although there was kind of about a 12 minute lag from injection to the deepest plane of anesthetic. So that was long, but it was safe. It really seemed safe. So everybody was like, run, let's get that permit amended. Flipping back, it goes all the way, this is gonna happen a lot, it is go, going back to Vancouver and we're presented with this guy and this is Flash Gordon. And uh, there he is. Now this is an adult California sea lion, so you know, not quite that adult stellar sea lion, but he's, he's a good 400 kilograms. Um, and this is our first time trying this combination in the wild and getting to an animal here in Vancouver um, to remove that um, that entanglement. And so, um, well, it's, sorry, it's a, it's a fish hook in this guy. Uh, so with, with Flash Gordon, um, what we did was we actually brought, oh, that's my dog saying hello. Um, I had a little word with the dog and the kids. I'm, I'm not sure it's gonna help out, but um, so that's him darted against about 12 minutes from dart for him to get fully anesthetized. Um, and in the case of this sea lion, what we did because of that injury and because we needed to get um, you know, that hook out, we actually did bring him back to the Marine Mammal Rescue Center in Van downtown Vancouver, and then with an endoscope, get that out. But that was, that was huge. Um, so permits were being amended. People were kind of happy with everything. People were getting excited. Remember, we still have this endangered population of sea lion in, um, in the western part of the Aleutian Islands through Alaska that really needs help. So um, we had some uh, folks, collaborators in Russia as well, try some stuff that helped too. And then we, then we were on, we started uh, planning our first field project using this combination and decided, um, well, we didn't really decide, but it was decided for us that we need to try this combination on the less um, uh, endangered. So, so more of a population of concern in, in Southeast Alaska. So it's a stellar sea lion, same species, but a population of concern, not the endangered Western population. And what we did was we talked a lot to folks who'd done this before, who darted animals in the past. What have we learned? What can we do? Um, and, and everyone kind of went, you know, you got to be really careful. Um, you got to not excite the animals. You don't want them running. If the animals um, go into the water, it's a dead animal. You do not want that to happen. So we um, went through and, um, and uh, you know, learned from these guys figured things out, and there we were, out 2000, now it's um, uh, fall 2010, it's the first time permits have been allowed to uh, um, dart uh, free-ranging stellar sea lions anywhere in North America. Permits had been drawn um, out for about uh, 10 years now, maybe 12 years at this point. No one had been able to get hands on these animals, uh, so this was huge. And so we loaded up the guns, 
That's our dart gun. Um, we got ourselves a target and it worked. The dart went in, we got our animal and she stayed up on the water. Uh, we waited that 12 minutes, which seemed like forever, but we went down to her. She was completely anesthetized. We um, got her intubated and stabilized. And then these guys went to work. And so these guys need to do a couple of things um, when they're dealing with one of these sea lions for all their research projects. They need just a couple of little samples, a few tiny little non time consuming things that need. I'm just kidding. They need to really get a hold of these animals and do a whole lot. Every one of these animals is an incredibly value, valuable and an incredible source of information. So we're kind of trialing um, all this on this non-endangered Southeast uh, Alaskan population of stellar sea lions, but they're still incredibly valuable animals to serve as controls and comparisons to the Western population. Now, that first one was awesome. That um, second one was not awesome. The second one went in the water. Um, and that, you know, the expression of seeing your life pass before your eyes. I don't know if it was my life, but I thought, oh my God, we've just put in 12 to 15 years of work into this. Um, folks have been trying their hardest to get their hands on these endangered animals. I want a method that I can use in the field and get permits um, for in the field to disentangle sea lions. And the animal just went in the water. Remember what I said there, an animal in the water is a dead animal. Um, that was the, the dogma. And so we, we, you know, we were out on the beach, on the rocks, the skiff, we were working from a big boat and the skiff was bringing people back and forth. And when that dart hit the animal and that dart went in the water, my heart just sank. Um, and I just thought we were through. And um, so we waited and waited and we combed the beach and scrambled on rocks and darkness was coming. And slowly but surely, everybody was like, dude, you, you got to call it. And I went, all right, um, I guess we got to call it. So it was, it was myself and Brian Fadley and Tom Gillette kind of the two guys who put most of the effort into trying to deal with wild sea lions in the, in the West. And um, we're just leaving and so bummed out. And as we're leaving um, in the water, there's this floating, um, you know, obvious sea lion. It's just a kind of a yellow belly. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, there she is. And sure as, sure as heck, she she drowned and, and there she was. And then it's like, oh my gosh, got to do the necropsy. And, and the reports and the phone calls and oh my god i've just failed every sea lion everywhere and uh well um the amazing part was she wasn't dead she was sitting there um sleeping under the water and when we washed her every two or three minutes she'd lift her head out of the water take a breath and and then go back under and bubble and we could get to her and we darted that one um, to reverse her. And then it happened two more times during that trip. So we got three animals successfully, but two other animals went into water. Every single one of them uh, was fine. We either followed them for about 45 minutes until they recovered on their own, um, reversed them, or, um, well, those were the only other uh, options actually, but every animal was fine. Now we've got a game changer, especially for animals that are entangled sitting by the water. From going from um, the dogma of you got to knock this thing out so fast that it can't possibly go into the water to holy cow, if they go in the water, we still have a really good chance of either not worrying about them, letting them get away, letting them recover, or getting to them, particularly for that disentanglement stuff. So from heart sinking to, oh my gosh, we are going somewhere. The next step was bringing this onto the road. Um, and this is the Western population of, of animals. So these are much bigger animals way out there working in most incredible conditions anywhere out through the Aleutians, working with the team from Southeast Alaska that we did all this stuff and we've been incredibly successful and we've had tag deployments that are records. Um, and, and those guys are gangbusters. They're learning a lot. They're protecting marine resources. They're changing the way fisheries work. Um, they're changing the way, um, you know, uh, rookery protections work um, and they're learning about why animals in one part of their range are doing well and why animals in another part are not doing well. And it's, it's awesome. It's on the road to success. And then back home, 
um, here, we um, use that and started our own program, which has been incredibly successful and, and working particularly with with our biologist, Dr. Wendy Saslow, who's, who's really kind of taken all this to, to heart. We know that there's probably about 400 sea lions. Um, uh, um, you can see all my comments. Oh, I think anyway, um, we know that um, uh, well, there are probably about 400 sea lions at any one time just here in BC that are entangled in, in a variety of different gear. So um, getting the permission from DFO and working so close with our um, DFO counterparts, we've actually been out there successful. Um, dozens of animals now rescued. We were just out last week with DFO and, and, and getting to an animal that was pretty severely um, entangled. And then it's been an incredible privilege, but also taking this on the road and, and folks in Alaska are using this um, method. Of course, the people back in California at the Marine Mammal Center, Bill brought it back and, and those folks have been using it and bringing it to Mexico. And um, we've talked to folks in, in um, Australia, South Africa, and, and those guys are using this combination. And, and of course here, uh, just close to us at Washington State, this is my good buddy, Joe Gatos and, and Lasana Lawner, um, Joe from Sea Doc Society and Lasana from, um, from uh, SR3 and now Minnesota Zoo. Um, going ahead and darting the first Washington State animal too in 2016, and those guys going bang, gangbusters with this and 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 taking off. So it's been pretty cool. I'm going to show you a nine minute video, and I'm going to um, uh, probably talk through it. And uh, if it's going too long, I'll get Danica to shut me down. And otherwise, um, I'll try and answer some questions online if I can. Obviously, obviously, I can't um, deal with your uh, comments because I can't click away from this. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'm keeping an eye out on the chat. I'll be collecting all of those questions coming in. And in the meantime, we'll keep an eye out on this video. It's coming in pretty steady. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lag, but it's looking good so far. All right, I'll, I can talk through this. So um, I should give out the warning. Some of these injuries are quite uh, quite devastating. That's uh, Wendy Sanislo, our biologist working with me. Um, this is an adult uh, California male sea lion um, successfully darted uh, in Barkley Sound just to, uh, off of Euclid. Um, This is uh, you know one of our first uh, successful disentanglements here in, in Vancouver after that initial Flash Gordon guy that was brought into our facility. So. This was a huge one for us. Um, obviously, pre-COVID, um, lots of folks not wearing masks and enjoying each other's company. Um, and uh, so this was huge. This is him afterwards. So um, it's a 12-minute time for anesthetics. So once the animal's darted, we wait 12 minutes. Um, that is a long time. That's an incredibly long period of time when we dart one in the water. So this is an example of one that's obviously going to go in the water. Um, this is on the east side of Vancouver Island, uh, and um, you'll see the dart go in, um, slightly different angle, but obviously the animal is going to react and go in the water. Uh, what I'd love to do is get a resting sleeping animal that's within a bunch of other animals that's kind of high from the water, and then, um, you know, the dart goes in, bounces out, and they kind of look at it, the other sea lions go, which one of y'all bit me, and then fall asleep. But if they go in the water, like I say, we can get to them. We've got a very specific search pattern with our DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, support boats. And uh, and you'll see as we turn this guy around, you'll kind of see the extent of these injuries and they're, they're kind of bad. So it's expensive uh, to go after one of these animals. I estimate each animal between the drugs, the transportation, um, the number of people involved is probably about $2,800 to get to, to disentangle. Um, so there are certainly folks that that um, question, you know, that expenditure and is it worth it? And well, I don't know about you, but it's no question to me, but certainly with an injury that's directly caused by humans and being able to do something about it has been incredible. Um, the, uh, so you can see that the combination is kind of safe, but you have to be careful because you can rouse an animal through that. One of the drugs that we use, metatomidine, it kind of goes to the same receptors that epinephrine um, goes to or adrenaline goes to. So if the animal is really riled up, they'll kind of work themselves through the combination. So 
there are animals definitely that get away from us, um, but you know the, the 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 things that make it slow acting and not uh, a hugely deep plane of anesthetic also make it very safe. And those animals will swim away and will recite them again. So you can see the deep nature of that. A lot of plastic packing straps is what we deal with. In this particular sea lion, we are looking at um, a, a braided uh, nylon uh, fishing net that this animal got entrapped in. That's me getting really mad. I think I used a bad word at our tagging gun. And then the animal's getting a little bit more awake. So I think we're going to decide to to let this guy go. And uh, we'll probably try again. And you can kind of see. So um, super nice part about this is it's a very reversible anesthetic. So once we're done, you saw that needle go in. That's the reversal. It takes about eight minutes from the time we we give that injection for an animal to become pretty fully roused up again. So you can see that that netting there. And I think we have one more animal. This one's particularly close to my heart. This is off of Long Beach near Tofino on the west side of Vancouver Island. This is a stellar sea lion female, and she has a pup. Um, and she's quite deeply entangled. If she dies, and we know um, from, from observations from Wendy's work, the vast majority of these animals that have these neck entanglements, they will eventually die from that. And it's a very long, slow, months long, if not longer process, uh, and it's not nice. So unfortunately, you're going to see my butt here too. It's not a good butt. I apologize. Um, but there she is. She's got that ring neck around her. She's got the dart. She's moving. Um, and as I say, she has a pup with her. So if she dies, that pup's going to die as well. That's the butt. Sorry about that. Try to ignore that if you can. And then um, also here, you'll see another animal walk by that's got her flasher. So that's our animal. That's our female that we want to get to. She's had the dart in. You can kind of see it there. And then look at that guy. There's another guy with a flasher. Now, unfortunately for us, it's kind of one shot. You get one shot on a hollow, and then you don't get another shot for a long period of time. The hollow will clear. Um, we've got the boat standing off to the side. So in case she goes in the water, we go into recovery mode in the water and we do disentangle in the water. I want to say about 60% of our animals or, or more go back into the water after they've been darted. Um, so you see a really deep um, necrotic net entanglement. This girl has been hurting for a really long period of time. Um, just pulling that carefully out. You don't want to drag it. You can lacerate things like um, our, uh, you know, uh, juggler vein, carotid artery. Um, uh, if you if you pull, so we try and kind of peel the, the entanglement out. And then that's uh, Gwyneth Nordstrom, one of our vet techs, helping me out. So we're going to clean that wound. For this animal, because it was so deep, a little bit necrotic, um, we do give a long-lasting antibiotic injection. So you see that go in um, as well. And then uh, you kind of see the waves work in here. Some of us, uh, this is where DFO comes in as well. They're, they're <laughs> We get so, look at everybody's focused on the animal. No one's looking at this massive wave. So folks are looking out for us. Um, they're ready to rescue us as well as the sea line if things go awry. Um, that's the antibiotic that we put in. And uh, and then it's time for the reversal. And I think for this uh, final scene, I think we've got Shani um, doing, so we've given the reversal. <laughs> I like the scratchy scratch sea lines. I got, I'm not lying. I love these guys and I still do. So there she is. I think that's the second reversal because um, she wasn't waking up, but she actually was waking up. And now we're like, Shani, she 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 was awake. She was just sort of faking it, and that's her. So it doesn't work that fast. That's actually the second one, just because we thought it was taking too long, but she was just sleeping at that point. Um, so that's her. That's her neck entanglement, and uh, and you'll see her slip uh, into the water there, all nice and awake again. And that to me is what it's all about. That that brings everything. That's so awesome. So, um, you know, some people, as, as they say that, you know, is it worth it? Well, um, these are the three guys that you just saw. Um, and, uh, and the bottom picture there is, is that female we just disentangled um, with her pup several months later and everybody's looking fat and happy and all scars are healing. So is it worth it? You betcha. Um, and uh, I'm very, very, very proud to be a uh, a tiny part of this incredible team that's been doing this now and getting better at it and learning from each other and sharing information and just doing good things for good animals all together. And it's been, uh, been my honor and privilege to work with all these guys. And of course, um, of course, this one's always for tag at the end. So I will answer some questions if I can. I might not figure out how this works, but uh, I'll do my best. And I think we've got a, a few minutes left if anyone's got any questions on stuff. 
Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation and it's so uplifting to see the success of it all. And I think kind of those those stories with happy endings is are extra appreciated right now by everyone. And we have lots of questions coming in from our audience. So thank you so much. I'll get started with some that I've collected and please for our audience, feel free to send in more. We um, are going to try and get through as many as we can. Um, so kind of starting with, I guess, the initial process of finding these animals that are in need of your help, kind of who is responsible for identifying them? And then how do you find the entangled animals when you're actually headed out with the team to help? Yeah, that's a, that's a super good question. <clears throat> so we work with a lot of folks. Um, whale watching companies uh, will report animals to us. Um, folks like at the Race Rocks Lighthouse, so Equal Guardians, uh, Lighthouse Keepers, they'll keep an eye out for, uh, for animals. They'll report to us. Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, um, fisheries officers and biologists, of course, researchers. Um, and then mostly the public, uh, quite honestly, will report animals to us now. We've kind of learned over time um, that we can get really frustrated when we go after one animal, uh, even though they're entangled and they could be quite severely injured. They're very mobile. So we're very, uh, uh, you know, very dependent on weather, uh, very dependent on, on Department of Fisheries and Oceans availability. Um, and then, of course, trying to reliably get to an animal. So we do try and get to um, folks to identify an animal that's on a specific haul out of rookery at least a day or two or three days, even better, um, consistently. Um, for us, it's it's um, the best case scenario for us is to go to a large haul out or a rookery where we know several animals have been reported and there, then our chances of success go up. So it can be very frustrating for us. We've done it, um, you know, chasing an animal around last week. Um, we got uh, this this kind of plastic pool or boat cover drain. Oh, there's Trevor saying hi. Um, off an animal that we've been chasing since February. Um, so it can be very, very frustrating to do that. Wonderful. And I guess if anyone in our audience um, do find themselves out on the water, how do you report it? Who do you report it to? Oh, you can ask me this. Um, I never remember the phone numbers, but it's either to um, here in British Columbia to the Department of Fisheries and Ocean Stranding Hotline or directly to our Marine Mammal Rescue Center um, hotline. And I'm sure we can publish the numbers on that. Everything's available through the, through the rescue.org uh, website as well. Ocean.rescue.ocean.org. I forgot that. Rescue.ocean.org. And I can pop that link in the chat in just a moment for everyone. Um, again, lots of great questions coming through. It's excellent to see such an engaged audience. And so there's quite a few questions about what are the most common types of materials that you're seeing these animals get entangled in? Is there a, you know, a top three that people should watch out for? Yeah, the number one thing we get, the overwhelming majority of our animals are affected by plastic packing straps. So these are those kind of heat sealed plastic straps that you see on your amazon.com box. Um, they're on bait boxes, that's probably the source. Um, but they're things that everyone has come into contact with. We kind of use these as, as a good example of plastic pollution, obviously. Our plastics program here at OceanWise is, is highly involved with microplastics, but we kind of use the visual of, of these, you know, plastic packing straps to kind of highlight that program and plastic pollution in general. Um, but yeah, those are bad. Um, they're thin, um, they're, they have very sharp edges. Um, once they get down the neck of an animal, the, the direction of the animal's hair coat, the hair kind of prevents it from coming off. And then as it starts to turn a little bit, it just starts cutting and it just keeps cutting deeper and deeper. So they're, they're a terrible thing. Um, but then, yeah, we, we, you know, definitely salmon fishing hooks, the, um, um, the gill nets, braided um, nets. Um, like I say, we, we get some weird stuff like this uh, port hatch cover or something that was on this animal last week. Um, then we get um, also crab pot. Uh, elastic traps and, and those can be bad because they're kind of constricting their their heavy gauge rubber and they're constricting on a neck and, and sometimes if you anesthetize an animal with those or the animal just goes into a position where that just constricts too badly so 
So those can be particularly uh, particularly bad. I, I know the folks in Alaska deal with those more than we do here in BC. Thanks. Definitely a lot to keep an eye out for. And I know that I've started at home making sure that if I do ever have kind of one of those packing straps to cut it before it's ever going, you know, to be recycled or disposed of. And so that's something that everyone can take away from today is to, you know, help with kind of taking apart all of those risks as you might be putting it out on the curb appropriately, but you're never really sure where those items are going to end up. So helping reduce some of the risk by cutting those things up and making sure they're a little bit safer. Um, there was some great, I mean, videos and lots of photos of the team. And so there's some questions around kind of how long does the whole disentanglement take for an animal? You talked a little bit about kind of the times that they're anesthetized for to wake up. But would you say, like, I guess, yeah, really, how long does the whole process take? Um, it can take days. Uh, so it depends on where the animal is. So we cover all of BC, obviously. So um, BC is full of really cool nooks and crannies that can be a little bit difficult to get to. So, um, you know, last week we're in Powell River, for example, and just the amount of time it took to get to Powell River um, and then being able to, you know, sight the animal um, and then and get to it. Um, by the time we were finishing up, um, we missed our ferry. So it was an overnight trip and then almost another full day to get back. So it can be a lot just because of logistics. The actual time, um, if everything goes smoothly, um, it's never, everything. everything's never gone according to plan. But, it, you know, once the dart is launched, it's about 12 minutes. Um, if they're on land, um, you know, it's another five minutes for the approach. The actual, like, hands on an animal and disentangling um, can take, um, you know, to 10 to 15 minutes and then about eight to 10 minutes on reversal. That's, that's if everything goes well, but if the animal goes in water, uh, we could be searching 20, 25 minutes. We want to get to an animal before about 45 minutes. That's when they start recovering again. Um, so yeah, it can, it can, it can take an hour or, or, or it can take about 30 minutes all told. Definitely um, a lot of care and investment in these animals. It's so wonderful to see. And so, you know, those were some pretty severe kind of injuries and wounds that we were seeing in your presentation. How long does it take these animals to heal once they face something like that? They are really good healers. So um, if you can get to them when they're still alive, uh, for the most part, they'll heal up. We've had one animal um, who, when we disentangled, um, that animal, it actually had a perforated trachea. We couldn't do anything about that. So it couldn't, it couldn't breathe right, it couldn't dive ever again. Um, but for the most part, as long as nothing's been vital, uh, nothing vital has been hit um, and they're still alive, more or less, um, they'll heal up really quickly. Now they will have a scar and, and it might take months to years to, to kind of fill in the whole scar, but they start healing right away. That's excellent. And I love those photos of some of these animals kind of, you know, while after you had disentangled them, seeing them do so well. Um, by tagging each of the animals that you help, um, do you know kind of what the approximate survival rate, you know, even after they've been disentangled are? Do you ever see repeat animals? Yeah, actually, um, we know working with our biologist friends, we've recited almost every animal that we've disentangled. I want to say we're about 75 to 80% recite. Uh, so we're pretty sure most of these animals actually do really, really well. Um, even with pups the next year, uh, that's their business. Yeah. That's awesome. Now I'm going to attempt to read this question out. This was about the specifics of the anesthetics mm -hmm. that you were using. Oh, uh, there's um, one in every crowd. I bet I know who that was. <laughs> this is my tongue twister for the day. So um, why are you choosing metatomidine instead of dexmetatomidine? That's really easy. Um, number one, uh, here in Canada, um, first off, dexmedetomidine is still protected under a trade um, mark. So you can't get generic um, powdered dexmedetomidine right now. So um, we need to highly concentrate that. So normally, for example, in the case of metatomidine, it's a um, 
It's a one milligram per ml solution. I think we're looking at at least 10 milligrams per ml or 20 milligrams per ml solutions reconstituted. So we can't re reconstitute dexmedetomidine here in Canada as yet. Nice. Well, I'm glad you understood the words I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so then but there's also another question coming in about what kind of single dose antibiotic you've used in cases where you've been um, kind of helping those animals out with that. Yeah, we're using um, the uh, um, cephalosporins, um, the long lasting uh, cephalosporin depot. So either uh, Convenia or Exceed or the, the two drugs Exceed typically um, in, in sea lions. Wonderful. And then one's coming in about, have you ever had to intubate an animal while you've been out in the field or had any animals stop voluntarily breathing? We've, um, with this particular combination and the, and the disentanglements, we have not because um, you know, by the time we get to an animal, everything's working really fast and we, and we try to reverse the animal within a few minutes of getting to the animal. So we actually have not had to intubate any of these, but for the research animals where we want to keep animals under anesthetic for a prolonged period of time, yeah, all of those animals are intubated and actually switched to a gas anesthetic and I'll start reversing the injectables fairly early and then maintain on gas just to um, bring them back out of it. And I'm not sure that this question is just thinking about how long you have to get further away from that animal, but um, there's some questions about kind of how reliable that eight minute um, post reversal to wake up is is that fairly standard? You know, it's going to be a pretty solid eight minutes. Does some wake up quicker? Um, I think for the most part, yeah, uh, the eight minutes is is pretty reliable. But yeah, of course, some animals um, wake up quicker, and and some animals uh, wake up slower for sure. And and we have given a second uh, dosage of reversal. So we reverse not just the metatomine, but we also reverse the detorphanol. So metatomine reversal is out of Pamazol. And the betorphanol reversal is naltrexone for us. So um, we have given a second dosage of both on occasion, just uh, just so I can be a little bit more reassured that things are, are moving in the right direction. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, more or less, it is right around that eight minute. Even the, the second reversal is just like that last video. You're kind of giving that and the animal's like waking up looking at you. Why are you giving me that shot? I was getting up. And I mean, I guess you know, you really highlighted kind of the some of the the bravery and the risks that you and your team take when you go out to look after those animals. Not not so, me. I, I stay clear. I got people for that. <laughs> Excellent. A very loyal team. Um, <laughs> but We've gone through a lot like, of people. It's weird. No. I'm just <laughs> uh, but you know, these animals are often in quite large uh, social groups. When you do dart one, um, kind of, are you just relying that the rest of the group is going to scatter? Do you ever get some curious animals checking you out while you're working? Um, there, there are some curious animals for sure. Most of them are curious in the water, not so much on land. Um, sea lions, both the stellar sea lions and the California sea lions that we work with, are, are incredibly, you know, forgiving animals that way. Um, they, uh, you know, they, they want to go away rather than go forwards. Um, certainly you don't want to be in an animal's way. You always want to make sure an animal has an exit route. Uh, and, and yeah, when you, when they figure out that you're on their, on their haul out or, or coming onto the haul out, then yeah, they, um, <laughs> they, they don't really want to be on that haul out. In fact, they don't want to be on that haul out for, for quite some hours, um, you know, and, and resting again in, in some cases. So really if we miss a shot or disturb a rookery, uh, or excuse me, a haul out, um, then then it, it's not quite the same uh, for, for at least a, a day or two after we've done that. Um, there have been animals, I, I think one of the agents that we don't res uh, reverse or the single agent we don't reverse is midazolam, which is a um, kind of like a Valium derivative drug, a benzodiazepine, and it, it kind of causes amnesia and it just makes you not stressed out. Um, and we've had animals after being reversed in the water, like kind of hang out with us a little bit and be very curious about things. We've had one kind of sort of jump on the back of the boat and look in, um, but I think it's just because they, they got a little bit of that amnesic uh, drug still on board. Ah, uh, yes, they they must be feeling pretty good after that one. <laughs> I, um, so thank you. Great. 
Thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation. We're just getting the, to the end of today's time. So I encourage our audience to send a thank you or share what you enjoyed most. There is a survey that will pop up at the end of today's program. So we always love to hear what you learned and what you took away from today's program. I'm going to wrap up today as you send in your thank yous to Marty with a few notes about what you can look forward coming to next. We are really excited that while things may be on pause at the Vancouver Aquarium, that online learning and education and research is going to be continuing. So we have lots of great programs coming up for you over the next little while. So next week, we're really excited to be joined by Laura Borden, who's going to be talking about her biodiversity research here in Howe Sound in British Columbia. And we're going to be looking at the dynamics of the kelp ecosystem. So we hope to see many of you tuning back in and learning about that great work that's here in our ocean backyard. You can Make sure that you're staying on top of all of the great programs for Tales from the Deep, Insights from OceanWise Research by following the OceanWise page on Facebook. So you'll see weekly updates of those programs and it gives you a great reminder to tune in when it's Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. As we head into September, we're looking at Science Literacy Week as well as Sea Otter Awareness Week. And so we're really excited to be hosting a virtual book launch for the new book from Karen Otio Kailan and the Stink Inc. And we're going to be not only joined by the author and illustrator, but our very own Lindsay Ackhurst from our Marine Mammal Rescue Center. And if you search the title of the book, and I'll pop the link if I have time in the chat, um, or even just head over to our vanaqua.org online learning page, you'll see that there's actually an ongoing fundraiser from the publisher that if you buy the book before October 15th, $5 go towards fundraising for the Marine Mammal Rescue Center and all this great work, including some of the work that Marty shared with us today. So we hope to see you joining us on September 22nd for that program. And that's all for what's coming up next right now. We want to really stay connected with you. We love seeing our audience and connecting to you. We have some great programs. If you want to check out what's coming up next or even message us, you can always find us on Twitter at OceanWiseEDU. Check out our live streams for the next few weeks at ocean.org slash learn online. And while we are going through this new transformation for the Vancouver Aquarium, OceanWise wants to continue to be able to offer great work in conservation research and education. And so you can find out great ways to connect to us and support by visiting vanaqua.org slash support slash community. And so thank you again. Thank you so much, Marty, for a fantastic presentation. And we're Thanks looking too. forward to more programs. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>